Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Hawaii. And I'm Pamela Lawrence in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Winter in Adelaide. Welcome to Dog Edition, the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today's episode is called Dogs Get Legal Rights in the UK. So I am imagining we're going to start seeing dogs driving and being able to vote. Is is that right, Sarah? <laughs> Not quite, Jim. But they do now have a paw at the table because the UK <laughs> because the UK government is going to be changing its laws to make sure that dogs and other animals are taken into consideration when laws are made by those at the top. Now it's all part of a new animal welfare plan, which is also going to crack down on illegal puppy smuggling and puppy theft, which have both skyrocketed over the past year. And then later on in the show, I talk about how I got to travel to New York City to do one of my favorite things, visit a museum, and it was of one of my favorite things, dogs. So I got to see the AKC Museum of the Dog, and and you get to come along on my journey with me a little bit later. That sounds like so much fun, Pam. And as always, stop by the hydrant with us at the end of the show for a rundown on some of the doggy headlines that captured our attention this week. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. We've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? When I stare into my dog's eyes, I have no doubt that I see love staring right back at me. Of course, it could just be a look of, where's my treat? But I'm going to go with the love thing, right? Because we know that our dogs can experience all kinds of feelings, from pain and fear to contentment and joy. Animal sentience, that's the term, and it is the capacity for animals to feel or perceive the world around them and it is scientifically proven. But recognizing that fact and taking it into consideration when governments make laws, why, that is a whole new conversation. So the United Kingdom's move recently to join only a handful of other countries in recognizing animals in sentient law is a big deal, especially since the legislation will underpin a new plan to improve the welfare and treatment of animals with illegal puppy farms and puppy theft high on the agenda. Every year, thousands of puppies are smuggled across Central and Eastern Europe and sold to unsuspecting dog lovers in the UK. Secretly filmed by undercover staff from the Dogs Trust, this is one of a network of grim Eastern European puppy farms behind a multi-million pound trade. But stories like this from ITV News have become more frequent as the demand for puppies has skyrocketed during the pandemic. Coronavirus has really seen a surge in demand for dogs for people because they've wanted companionship, they wanted exercise when they're locked down. David Bowles is Head of Public Affairs with the RSPCA in the UK. So what we've seen is because the UK market has not been able to supply that demand, prices have doubled. Dog theft has doubled, um, imports from other countries have doubled, and and this has been um, a real problem for us, not just because we're seeing dogs coming in that have been produced in conditions which would be illegal here, but we're also seeing more diseases coming into the, to the UK. Dog welfare charity Dogs Trust estimates the puppy smuggling trade soared by more than 60% in 2020. Many of those traded illegally are as young as five to eight weeks old. They have major health or behavioural problems as a result and they're being sold for extortionate prices. Unfortunately, um, buying a puppy is a very emotional purchase. And even though the RSPCA is putting out lots of information about don't trust people, don't hand over large amounts of uh, money in in used banknotes on service stations, people still do that because once they see the puppy, they fall in love or they think they're going to rescue it and give it a better home. Long-held calls by animal welfare groups to stamp out the practice have now been heard, with the UK government promising better protections for pets, farm animals and wildlife at home and abroad in its action plan for animal welfare. What's being promised is ambitious, says David, but achievable. What what the RSPCA believes is that this is really a a once-in-a-lifetime 
um, opportunity. The government has said, because they know that it plays well with their voters, they know that the public loves animals and they know the public will vote for better animal welfare conditions. That's why they're doing it. Um, and what we, we hope is that we will take this once in a generation opportunity, uh, revamp all of our legislation, some of which, as I say, goes back 60, 70 years, um, and give the UK a, uh, a framework of animal welfare laws which are fit for purpose and fit for the next generation. On the list are changes to puppy import rules, a crackdown on pet theft through a government task force, another attempt to ban electronic collars and the compulsory microchipping of cats. The British government also wants to end the export of live animals for slaughter, ban the import of hunting trophies, improve standards in zoos and give police more power to protect farm animals. Well, the action plan is is very exciting. You know, it's been um, a long time since we've had such a broad set of uh, commitments from the UK government uh, towards the protection of uh, animals and their welfare, and it covers all animal issues. Claire Bass is Executive Director of Humane Society International UK. For her, there's one crucial concept underpinning the government's plan, and that's a law recognising animals as sentient beings who are aware of feelings and sensations. So they have the capacity to have uh, feelings, both positive, such as uh, pleasure and joy, contentment, and also, of course, negative, such as as, as fear um, and, and pain and stress. The UK joins a list of countries across the EU, as well as New Zealand, Canada and Colombia, in recognising animal sentience, although the wording, interpretation and enforceability of each nation's legislation means it's still a very grey area. But what is black and white is that British policymakers will be scrutinised by an animal sentience committee on whether animal welfare is considered during their decision-making. It enshrines uh, that principle in law um, and it attaches to that uh, recognition a requirement for government to take animals' welfare needs into account when they're making uh, and implementing policies. And that's not just policies, you know, that that very clearly directly affect animals, such as perhaps, you know, uh, farming policies, but any policy that government's, um, you know, considering. The proposed reforms are no doubt a win for Humane Society International UK and the dozens of other animal welfare groups that have fought for change for years. But Claire's crusade isn't just professional, it's very, very personal. Henry is, uh, he's four years old now, he's a a golden retriever sort of mix. Um, And he started out his life in uh, a dog meat farm in South Korea, just outside Seoul, Um, He grew up uh, in a cage that was probably about a a metre by two metres in size, uh, which he shared with his uh, two sisters and his mother. Henry is sitting on Claire's feet in London while we chat, worlds away from his start in life, like hundreds of thousands of dogs in South Korea, caught up in a centuries-old practice. His fate was a horrific one, you know, un- unimaginable to, to those of us who, you know, share our lives with dogs. Uh, and that was to be turned into soup, which is eaten by, you know, a, a decreasing number of South Korean people, um, particularly sort of, of older generations. Claire rescued Henry while working in South Korea with local groups as part of Humane Society International's dog meat closure program. Henry is um, is my daily reminder of of you know the change that we can make for all animals and their, their individual stories are really important and they're they're certainly helping change hearts and minds. Changing the hearts and minds of animal lovers and governments alike. That is such a great piece, Carol. I I, I would hope that the United Kingdom will just be the start, and we're going to see this around the world. What what's happening around the world in terms of these animal rights? It's really interesting, Jim. It changes depending on on where you look. So the EU has been at the forefront of this for some time, and different countries within the EU are slightly changing the wording so that you know it might be more or less um, in favour of of animals in this space. Um, the US, as I understand. Understand Oregon, the state of Oregon, uh, has uh, mm-hmm. has enacted this, um, and there's lots of conversations being had in other states, but couldn't find anything to say that they, you know, 
ticked it off as a priority. And here in Australia, the Australian Capital Territory, where Canberra, our capital, sits, um, is the only jurisdiction that has animal sentience law or regulations recognising animals in, in its legislation. Well, we will continue to follow this as these laws get passed across the world because clearly they're really important. We'll be right back. You're listening to Dog Edition. Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What is Everpup? Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste. They find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA-registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple-checked for quality. Seeing is believing. So try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon. But here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup Club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. Welcome back to Dog Edition. Dogs were once depicted on the walls of caves. After that, during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, they appeared in hunting scenes as working dogs. Eventually, our canines became companions, and they were represented in art on the laps of owners and at their feet dutifully in their homes. After 1873, the American Kennel Club introduced illustrations of breed standards, and that is when solo dog portraits became popular. The 19th century brought us portraits of people with their dogs by artists like John Singer Sargent. And a more contemporary example of dogs in art history would have to be Keith Haring's most iconic image, the barking dog with its minimalist outline style and bright primary colors. Those first started appearing in New York subway drawings in the early 1980s. So it is no surprise that a museum exists to document and preserve the artwork featuring the muse that we call Dog. Head northwest on East 41st Street toward Pershing Square. Driving north on Park Avenue in New York City, you come to the Pershing Square Viaduct and a beautiful view of the southern side of Grand Central Terminal. Turn onto East 40th, and you're met with the silhouettes of dogs running along the facade of a building, beckoning you into the AKC Museum of the Dog. The um, AKC started in 1884. Not shortly after that, did they start collecting paintings and sculptures of prominent, important dogs and by prominent, important artists. The AKC collection is upstairs, and it's uh, about 300 plus items, and the museum collection is about 1,700 items. You're not going to find a velvet wall hanging depicting dogs playing poker here. 
Although the AKC Museum of the Dog's director, Alan Fossil, sold two dogs playing poker paintings from Cassius Marcellus Coolidge's 1903 series for $590,400. This was at Doyle, New York's annual Dogs in Art auction, when Mr. Fossil was senior vice president of paintings there. He is deeply embedded in the world of dog art. I worked for 17 years selling several hundred dog paintings a year, so I know where most of the bodies are buried. And one of my favorite paintings I ever sold was this one by Charles Olivier de Pen, a French artist of Hounds and Snow. It's not only a great dog painting, it's also just a great painting itself. The painting is on a beveled panel and depicts four hounds clustered together in the snow in the foreground. In the background is a figure leaning against a fence. The artist, Charles Olivier de Pen's love of animals, especially dogs, and scenes of the hunt, was to be the driving force behind his art. These are the types of important pieces Mr. Fossil keeps his eye on in the hopes of adding to the collection. There are, there are a good half dozen I'm tracking and you know, <laughs> Google alert. talking to people. Yes, it's, 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 it's sort of, I know where they are and what I try to bring to the table being an art historian and also in the auction world, having a, a, a very good knowledge of what is good, better, and best. I think one of the things I'm looking at is making sure that the pieces have a certain amount of artistic quality and um, important documentary quality. The museum has a mission to preserve and document these works of art for the art history, but also, from the American Kennel Club perspective, to show the progression of the breed standards. There are 197 breeds recognized by the AKC who codified standards back in the 1850s. This is a pug of around 1790 or so. And um, you wouldn't recognize it. His legs are much longer. He has much more of a muscle here. The pug by the artist Richard Ramsey Reinagel looks very different from the pugs we see today. Portraits like this one can be used by breeders to, over time, return dogs back to the original standard. It made me curious about how my two Cavalier King Charles Spaniels may have looked earlier in the genetic line. Much like your Cavalier, yeah. the muzzle had become so pushed in. They made a concerted effort in the 1920s to say, they took some paintings and do you have a Cavalier that looks like this with more of a muzzle? We're going to breed him back. As I wander around the AKC Museum of the Dog, I'm struck by the thought that this museum is for serious art history enthusiasts, a thought confirmed by the 1677 Abraham Hondius masterpiece hanging on a wall on the first floor. The Amsterdam Dog Market uh, is probably one of the top five dog paintings in the world. It's, there's nothing quite like it, and it plays, displays over 50 dogs. I'm tempted to test my knowledge of breeds as I look at the painting. On the lower level, you see a kennel with all sorts of dogs in various states of play. There's a litter of puppies in the scene. On the top tier, you see the transactions taking place. There's a woman looking for a lap dog. And she has a variety of little small dogs that she's looking at here. So we assume this is probably much like an advertisement or a shop sign of the day for a, 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 a dog breeder. While the art in the museum is serious, the museum itself has a playful side that should appeal to all ages of dog lover. Step up to the Find Your Match interactive exhibit to see what breed of dog you most look like. Touch this, okay. and you look at the camera. Okay. So you make stand sure your here. face is here. There. Yeah. And then you take a photograph and say wolf. Wolf. There you are. Oh, it's a lovely picture. And you accept that. <laughs> and it goes through all 197 breeds and tells you which one you look. And you look like a Labrador retriever. Well, I am cute as a Labrador. <laughs> I imagine this would be very popular. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I'm a lab. <laughs> <laughs> or play fetch upstairs with Molly. Molly? First. It's all virtual. Molly, watch me. <whistles> Molly, come. <whistles> oh, you give me the treat. good girl. Okay. Oh. And then you get to throw the ball. The virtual dog Molly is actually a 10-month-old lab named River who was filmed wearing a mocap or motion capture suit with 360 degrees of cameras. There's a YouTube video of how this interactive exhibit was created that's worth a watch. We'll add a link to that in the show notes. This is incredible. So it's... The kids love this. Oh, I'm sure. You asked about who our audience is. 
children, the, the youngsters love Molly, the millennials love Find Your Match, the adults <laughs> love everything in between. But it's a part of a, you know, the education process. The scope of the collection and the accompanying archives truly make this enjoyable experience in education. The, the collection of the museum is probably the best in the world, but combined with the AKC collection, there's nothing in the dog world that would touch this. But now, after visiting, I can't help but wonder if my dogs think I look like a Labrador retriever. You have convinced me. I gotta go see that museum. I gotta get on an airplane and see that. That sounds so cool because I, of course, I wanna find out what dog I most resemble. Now, I think that I look like a Jack Russell Terrier. But I don't know. We'll see what the computer says. What, what do you think, Kara? What is, what is the wise computer going to pick for your breed? Oh, I kind of think, and I, I have my hair straight most days, but it's actually really curly. And there are days when I think I actually look like Harvey, my Groodle or my golden doodle. <laughs> well, we are supposed to resemble our dogs. Isn't that a, isn't that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. You're right. I, when we, and you've seen some of these great uh, photo documentaries that where you know they they show the dog and the person they're like oh my gosh of course they're <laughs> of course they belong together. <laughs> I wonder if the museum will be showing some of those. Did you see anything like that? No, only uh, only very important works of art. No uh, side by side comparisons of you know celebrity dogs versus celebrity people or anything like that. <laughs> you got to go to Facebook for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now it's time to stop by the hydrant to take a rundown on some of the doggy headlines that captured our attention this week. Before we do that, speaking of hydrant, I have to ask uh, Caroline, did, do, do you have them? I have to know. Do, do you have them in Australia and are they called fire hydrants? So we do. And they are called fire hydrants, but they're not like the traditional fire hydrants in the US or the ones that I grew what? up watching on TV, the big red ones that sit above ground, right? Right, right. Yellow. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yellow. Um, the ones I'm... Well, spe- I- yellow, especially because, you know, they, they turn yellow after the dogs visit. So, yeah, where do, you, where do your dogs pee? <laughs> where are, yeah, where, where are your hydrants? <laughs> well, as I said previous uh, in the previous episode, they pee anywhere and everywhere, but not on hydrants okay. because they sit below ground. So when the fire... Yeah, when the firefighters mm. and the fire trucks turn up, they open a latch in the ground and that's where they plug their hoses in. Oh, guys, that means the hydrants are down under. (laughs) Boom, tish. (laughs) Okay, Caroline, what has caught your attention in the news this week? Well, Jim, I'm a hugger from way back. So COVID and Mm. social distancing has really made it hard for me. Luckily, Mm. though, I've been able to hug my dog. But I was reading this week and it seems that that might not have been so lucky for him. Mm. I came across in an what? article whether it's okay to hug your dog and the answer really surprised me. I wonder if it's going to surprise you too. So studies have shown that when humans and dogs interact in a positive way, oxytocin levels increase like in humans. But on the right. flip side, other research has found that for a dog, while interacting is one thing, hugging or restraint, which is kind of what they feel, Um, from you as a human might cause fear or stress and, you know, cause them to lash out and maybe bite. Oh. One of our dogs feels that way and the other dog is a hugger. So it's just like people. Not everyone's a hugger. (laughs) Not everyone's a hugger. The thing is, which I thought was interesting, that the traditional human sort of two-arm hug around the neck isn't quite the one that your dog wants. And I have tried this multiple times on Harvey and he has (laughs) uh, run for the hills. But that's because human arms around their upper bodies might just seem um, it's instinctively for them to fight or fret or flee. And so that's what happens. And so instead of hugging the dog, you can show affection by other ways, of course, by playing ball, by, you know, playing with, you know, toys, et cetera, et cetera. So I might have to try that one on Harvey instead. Ooh, I'm going to have to change some of my behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Kanga's still going to, Kanga approaches us for hugs, basically even putting her, her paws around our neck. Oh. But Rue, not at all. The other, totally, like, I, I think that Rue feels that she's being attacked and, and constrained. So to each dog their own opinion on hugging. That is really cool. Pam, what did you see this week? 
Oh, I learned about this dog in Scotland named Rocco. It's a one-year-old Cocker Spaniel. And Rocco has a job at Grant's Whiskey. Grant's Whiskey, meaning a, a, a whiskey company? Yes, Grant's Whiskey Distillery. And uh, Rocco is quality control, a quality control expert. Um, no. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so Rocco sniffs the wood caskets to pick up the scent of anything that's just not quite right as the whiskey matures and then alerts the uh, owners of Grant's whiskey <laughs> when something seems off. That, that isn't where I thought you were going with that, but that's much better. Otherwise, we'd have to call the, we'd have to get back into the legal rights of dogs not to be forced to get drunk on, on, the, exactly. on the job. I love that. So here in the United States, we just celebrated Memorial Day, where we look at our fallen soldiers. And I was looking for stories related to dogs and, 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 and the military. And I found this wonderful story of Sally, who was a dog during the Civil War. She was the mascot for the 11th Infantry of the Pennsylvania Regiment. And she was an incredibly loyal dog, and she was a constant companion in battle. She was actually at the Battle of Gettysburg, and they thought she had perished, and they went and looked for her for days. They finally found her, and she was guarding some of the soldiers who had fallen because she would not leave their side. And, but the story doesn't end there because Sally was later on depicted in a monument, one of these Civil War monuments that you see everywhere. And uh, she, there's a normal soldier on a horse at the top of it. And then if you look down at the bottom, there is a sculpture of Sally looking up at the soldier. So dogs have been in war for a long time and uh, they're loyal companions everywhere. That's a beautiful, beautiful story. And you made me think of some of the um, the dogs that we've had that have been honoured as uh, you know as part of our fallen soldiers in Australia too. Well, that is all we have time for today. So I'd like to thank you for bringing Dog Edition along with you on your walk. We will be back next week with another episode, but chances are you and your dog will be taking a walk between now and then. And we have something else for you to listen to. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, please check out DPN's sister show, The Long Leash, for Jim's extended conversations. This week, you can hear my conversation with dog behaviorist Steve Dale. And follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app so you can take us along on your dog walk next time. On the next episode of Dog Edition, we meet a woman who combined her celebrity dog hotel business with her mission to handle large-scale dog rescues. And we investigate if a bulldog really is tougher than a Maltese when it comes to pain sensitivity or if it's just how we perceive them. Visit dogedition.com. There is a button on the bottom right of every episode page so that you can easily leave us a voicemail and share your stories and thoughts with us. And check the show notes for links and information about the guests on this episode. We are looking for correspondence as we continue to grow this podcast and Dog Podcast Network. So if you are a content producer or a journalist or a podcaster or an audio storyteller and you love dogs, check out our 101 Dog Stories contest with over $15,000 in prize money. Join our pack. Be sure to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app and tell a friend about the show. I'm your resident news hound, Caroline Winter. (laughs) Nice. And I'm Pamela Lawrence. See you at the dog park. I think I know her. Sign off. I'm James Jacobson. I want to thank you for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, we wish you and your dog a very warm aloha.